Hey folks, in this interview, I get to sit down with the amazing Derek Story, and we're gonna be talking about Micro Four Thirds. This is Twitter. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. This is a show that I've been wanting to do for a while. I wanted to talk specifically with someone who is as passionate about small cameras and smaller sensors as I am to get to the bottom of a couple of topics. Derek Story is on the show today to help me get to the bottom of Micro Four Thirds. Is it a viable format? And if so, who's better? Olympus? Is it, should we be going with Lumix and Panasonic? Should we be foregoing all that and going with Sony and just jump to full frame? Should we kill all that and go to Fuji and get that Fuji look? Derek is going to answer all these questions for us. Derek Story, <laughs> welcome to the show, man. No pressure. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I'm just taking some notes here. Okay. All right. Be brilliant. Be brilliant. Yeah. Right. Just, just be right. like a politician, right? You can answer yeah, everything yeah. without answering. <laughs> <laughs> I just rephrase the question and throw it back to you. Exactly. No, you have to, when you answer a question without answering, you just have to um, start with a positive. You know, mm -hmm. that's a very good question, Frederick. I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. And then answer something completely different than what I asked. You. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. So, well, for the folks that may not know who Derek's story is, you are a veteran podcaster. You've been doing this stuff longer than I have. Um, you're a photographer. You're an educator. You're an author. You're a lot of things. Give us your elevator cocktail party speech of how you introduce Derek's story to strangers. Well, online, uh, the podcast is a big deal, right? The digital story has been going since 2005. We have a great audience of good sponsors. You know, it's just a lot of fun. I just love doing it. I'm lucky that I got in early, right? It's, yeah. uh, it's much easier then than now. And then I have another podcast called The Nimble Photographer. And uh, that one, I'm interviewing artists of uh, all kinds, all kinds, you know, illustrators, filmmakers, photographers, you name it. Um, trying to find out what makes them tick. I love and that. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's a really cool show. I love it. And then I do uh, online publishing and uh, social media, all that good stuff. And I'm a commercial photographer as well. Yeah, and you're, you know, a family man <laughs> and, and all am. kinds. Of, fit that in there, too, Derek. I am. So. I, hey, hey, two boys, two boys just wow. graduated from college. Oh, wow. Congratulations, not, man. Not Con one, but two, yeah. that I'm That's a hat it. trick. That is a hat yeah. trick. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Wow. Well, let, let's, uh, you know, speaking of, you know, just sort of all the things that you do back in the day. I remember when you and I first met, you were working at a company. I don't even know if they're still around now. Um, O'Reilly. You remember O'Reilly Publishing? That's where we met. I do, <laughs> I do remember O'Reilly and they are still around. Uh, they, uh, I was uh, a Mac digital media guy for them for nine years. And uh, that's where you and I worked because you were over at Apple uh, yeah, when, I, yep. when I met you. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm always indebted to O'Reilly because that's where I met you and, and a whole bunch of other people in the tech yeah. business. And so it's, it was a great gig for me. Uh, but since O'Reilly, I've been on my own. Yeah. 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 It's like uh, I remember chatting with you back then and, and Jim Hyde. You remember Jim Hyde, uh, who's still yeah. around? I believe Jim, Jim's still at Lynda.com. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's LinkedIn now. LinkedIn. Uh, uh, yeah. Linda, a subdivision of LinkedIn. Right? Yes, yeah, so yeah. They got a little corner in the back room where they have to do all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. L, L now stands for LinkedIn, not Linda. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Well, well. what I wanted to, while I have you on the hot seat here, what I wanted to talk about was just the idea um, and the, you know, I don't even know if it's still an argument anymore. There was this, this whole micro four thirds controversy going on around micro four third sensors are too small. You can't get a real shot out of them. Um, low light photography is out of the question. They focus too slow. Uh, it goes on and on and on. You know, if you yes. want to, if you want to be a real photographer, you need a full frame digital camera, like, a or even close to it, like a Fuji or, or a Sony, which seems to be like you, the go-to. Now we've got Nikon and Canon coming up, but what do you, what do you, where do you fall on that? Because I, um, I asked you specifically this because I know you shoot micro four thirds, but you have access to almost every camera out there, but you still choose to shoot micro four thirds. Give us, give us your, your positioning on that. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because that's true. I do have access to just about any camera that I want to test. And, you know, I have a lot of great partners in the business that, you know, make that happen. And, yes, for my own work, I mentioned earlier I'm a commercial photographer, and I actually shoot micro four-thirds for commercial photography. And I have no complaints, no complaints at all from my uh, clients uh, about the image quality, file size, any of that stuff. Now, that being said, uh, I am not shooting uh, the Milky Way for my clients, mm-hmm. you know, and, right. I, and I'm not doing uh, certain extreme types of photography. So I, I'm sure that comes into play. Uh, when you ticked off the short list of things that people were concerned about with a Micro Four Thirds sensor, which has a 2x crop factor compared to a full frame sensor, uh, the autofocusing speed that's that's pretty much gone now. Um, mm-hmm. The especially with the new Olympus, the EM1X, uh, that thing is a sports photography beast. It is a, a great camera, very powerful. Autofocusing, uh, not an issue anymore. Image quality, uh, I don't think is an issue. Uh, but there are certain things uh, that you just get from a larger physical sensor that you don't have in Micro Four Thirds. And uh, one of them is easier to soften the the background, you know, depth of field. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other is extreme low light performance. Uh, Those those two areas, you know, you got to look at what your photography is. Yeah, it's extreme low light performance as well as the, like you mentioned, the Milky Way, right? So longer Mm -hmm. exposures and and those sort of things tend to introduce noise in the scene. So what do you do As as a photographer? I mean, you're like we said at the beginning there, you're multifaceted. You don't like constrict yourself down to a certain genre of photography. What if one day Derek Story wakes up and he's like, you know what? I feel like shooting the Milky Way. I'm going to Iceland. I'm going to shoot the Milky Way. I'm going to get the Aurora Borealis or whatever. What do you do? Do you try to make it work with a Micro Four Thirds camera or do you reach for another camera and, you know, right tool for the right job sort of thing? Uh, well, I, I just shot it with my EM1 Mark II. Uh, like, for instance, when I, uh, my last trip to Iceland, mm-hmm. shooting, uh, you know, Aurora Borealis, I, I just used the uh, EM1 Mark II, and uh, it wasn't a problem for me at all. I think uh, even when I say things like shooting night skies, it really depends on, you know, where you are as a photographer. Like, when I go shoot the night sky, I'm shooting it as just a a general photographer who loves to do different things. I'm not an expert at night sky photography. Uh, you know, I'm not hanging my reputation on it. So the, the results that I come away with, you know, are, are very good. And for not being an expert at night sky, I think, uh, you know, the images look great. Yeah. Uh, You know, the one factor I want to just throw in there, Frederick, is that people, shouldn't underestimate the power of computational photography and you know olympus panasonic all of them uh, are are beginning to really understand how that can help them even with their regular mirrorless cameras we've all seen how good iphones are uh, and other devices the google pixel so forth so remember computational photography comes into play on these other cameras too And, uh, you know, that can really help with uh, things such as noise reduction and, you know, um, oversampling the image, things like that. Yeah. You you know, it's excuse me. It's it's interesting because you hit it right on the head, as I knew you would. Um, Just the the idea of, um, you know, the choosing your weapon. Right. And choosing, Mm -hmm. you know, micro four thirds and the small size of the lenses and you know, the the operating system for your camera of choice, whether it's Olympus or, or Lumix, et cetera, those play a huge factor into whether you're even going to take that camera out with you and thereby getting the shot, right? So if you don't Absolutely. love your camera, you don't love it. And it's like, I, gotta lo- I remember this, man, because I, when I was in the Air Force, we, my had one of those big low pro bags filled with cameras <laughs> and lenses. And it was literally you know, a workout to pick it up and full another bag full of film and, you know, going out was like, oh, I got to go shoot, you know. And now it's like, I don't, typically I don't take anything with me because I have my iPhone, but if I do take a proper camera, it's a micro four thirds camera, which is also very small and much more capable than anything I had back then. And that, you know, yeah, look at that lens. That's, that's, look at that thing. 20 <laughs> millimeter. This is a fantastic lens. So this is uh, the Panasonic 20 millimeter f 1.7, 
It's fast, it's light, it's sharp. Uh, and when you put it on the camera, it, it barely comes uh, beyond, you know, the, uh, you know, the, <laughs> look at the that. housing there. <laughs> look at that I mean, old stubby. <laughs> yeah, look at that. And, uh, it, and it doesn't hardly weigh anything at all, and it's, it's a beautiful lens. I have a number of lenses like this, and I can just carry these things anywhere. But what do you, Derek? Anywhere. What do you what do you say to people that are that are old school that say, "Yeah, Derek's story, that's nice," but anything that small can't make a good image? What are you printing five by sevens? Like, what what's uh, what's the deal with that? What's what's your response to those people? Yeah, you know, anything that small in terms of the sensor or the camera itself? The lens, the lens. Oh. Yeah, the, come on, uh, that's well, too that's too small to, called, to gather have light. You heard of a brand called? <laughs> have you heard of a brand called Leica? Yeah, uh, I, I hear that. <laughs> something they're, they're a fan yeah, they're going I, just, away. <laughs> I, I think they've got a few good images out there <laughs> yeah 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 no you know what uh lens formulas uh man i mean technology touches everything doesn't it yeah uh including uh how lenses are designed these days uh a smaller lens uh is absolutely a beautiful thing and especially if you don't need an aperture any faster than let's say f17 or 18 uh, you can get a fantastic compact lens now if you want to get f1.2 or you know somewhere in that area you are going to have to have a bigger lens and even micro four thirds four thirds uh have to you know make those lenses a little bit bigger so yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah every, it's all you know sooner or later you know physics does come into play yes but for me uh f17 f18 is is uh, great for most of my shooting so so switching gears a little bit what about um choice between so so like, let's say we made the decision and you you know we're we're going to stay in micro four thirds land it's great we love it you know the qualities for what we need is fine we're not shooting the aurora borealis or anything like that where you need that resolving power and if you do you'll go rent a camera and do it whatever um but w if you niche down to just micro four thirds that presents basically two choices right so you've got lumix and Olympus. On the Lumix side, the Panasonic Lumix side, they've got a bunch of cameras. You're holding up one of them right there, which we'll talk about in a second. And Olympus is coming on strong too, like you mentioned their OMD series of cameras. What, From a Derek Story perspective, what do you reach for all the time? What's, what's your go-to camera of choice? Um, I prefer Olympus a, a little bit more myself, and uh, that's just purely personal. Uh, mm -hmm. The two reasons. One is I love the styling of Olympus cameras. Uh, you know, they uh, Olympus has been making cameras for a long time. Uh, they have a DNA that I, I think that's aesthetically beautiful. And, and, you know, they keep that DNA even in their modern cameras. Uh, and I like that. And I also like the flexibility of the operating system with Olympus. You can basically program just about any dial, any button on the camera the way that you want. And, you know, those two things are very appealing for me. Uh, however, I do shoot with Panasonic cameras a lot, and um, I like them very much. Uh, it, but it is a whole different thing, which is interesting since they both accept the same lenses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and Panasonic's, uh, boy, I tell you, you know, they really understand video. They have, it seems like, from the very beginning. And uh, uh, Panasonic, uh, they're a little bit more modern in their styling and their design. Uh, so I, I think it... Between the two, for me, it really comes down to, you know, which one just appeals to you? Which one do you want to hold more? Mm -hmm. uh, because with with either brand, you're going to get a, a really quality tool, and they all take the same lenses. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, what, that's one of the, the, the really cool things about, like you mentioned, the system, the Micro Four Thirds system, is that interoperability between yes. those two, which is, you know, pretty awesome. Plus, you can buy third-party lenses outside of Olympus and, and Lumix and fit them on there or get an adapter and use whatever the heck you want. And, hey, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah. you know, uh, now this isn't limited, obviously, to Panasonic and Olympus. All mirrorless cameras uh, allow this, but... Uh, one of the things I was initially attracted to with Olympus was, you know, uh, sensor-based stabilization, uh, which they are just masters of. Uh, and yeah. uh, Panasonic, of course, is embracing it now as well. They didn't originally. But the fact that I can put one of my uh, old Nikon lenses on there that I really like, like the, you know, 105, you know, 2.5 or you know, something like that, and 
I have image stabilization. Uh, I have great quality. I have all that stuff. I mean, it is so much fun. And, and a lot of times I just feel like I want to be a, kind of a crazy artist. Yeah. Uh, I like to pull out those lenses and the adapters and just have a blast. I love it. You, do you ever you ever find yeah. yourself you ever find yourself um, in the, like wishing for a larger sensor, like even the Fuji Fuji's APS-C for the most part, right? Do you you ever find yourself yeah. wanting that larger sensor at all for anything? Well, I have. I also shoot uh, Pentax, uh, mm. and uh, so I have an APS-C Pentax. I have the K1, uh, which which I like a lot. But I'm not shooting that so much for the sensor is that sometimes I crave the optical viewfinder. I just, you know, I, it's, it's like, do I wear a baseball cap or not? I, yeah. you know, it's just kind of a, a, a mood thing. So I'm not shooting that so much uh, for the, for the sensor, but I am for the viewfinder. And I do have, uh, when I really want a full frame sensor and I really want to play with some of uh, those lenses, I have a Nikon D700 yeah, uh, that yeah. actually still shoots amazing images you know yeah. so really yeah, quality rumor, can ru rumor has it light hasn't changed that much over the decades so no no not really <laughs> still going probably <laughs> around the same speed all the properties are still the same so yeah. you you hit on on something that that i wanted to throw at you um being someone sitting in your position where you can you know like like we said before you have access to a ton of cameras it's up to you what you choose to go out with on a particular assignment or day or photo walk or workshop or whatever. The, what do you fall on the whole brand loyalty side of things that a lot of photographers seem to have almost to a, almost like a sports team degree where people will come to blows if you talk negatively about their camera brand. You know, I call it I call it digital Stockholm syndrome where you <laughs> invested so much money into this brand. You kind of have to love it and will defend your decision at all costs <laughs> like what do you, where do you fall on that uh well any any of my listeners uh, of the digital story will tell you that uh the brand loyalty thing for me uh not 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 such a big deal i i, I will say this that uh, one thing i do think a camera should be is an extension of your vision yeah. And so you need to get comfortable with it. You need to find an operating system that's easy for you to use. And, uh, you know, if you're switching cameras all the time, maybe you're thinking more about operating the camera than you are the image. So I think there is an argument to sort of sticking with a, a brand or two that you feel really comfortable with and is an extension of your vision. But in terms of what that brand is, uh, you know, come on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, name me a bad camera that's out there right now. Yeah, exactly. I, if, yeah, you, it, kind of what you were going, the, the direction you're going is the whole idea of everyone thinks differently and there's different modalities of learning and and the way that I perceive an operating system or user interface or user experience may be completely different than the, what you find usable, i.e. some people love the Sony operating system, some people hate it, right. some people love Lumix, some people hate it, etc. Right. So and then then there's also the ergonomics of the hardware and all that other stuff. So it boils down to, in my opinion, you'd correct me if, if you think I'm wrong. Uh, cameras are very, very personal. I mean, they are very, very personal in terms of your choice. And if you get into a discussion or a back and forth with someone online or otherwise that's telling you that your camera sucks and theirs is better, that's like that's like telling someone, you know what, you made the wrong spouse choice because mine is better than yours, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it falls into I mean, there's so many things that are like that, you know, Mac or PC back yep. in the day, Nikon, Canon, uh, you know, religion, politics. I mean, all, yeah. These are all subjects that uh, in all honesty sort of bore me in the sense that um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to change anyone's mind. Right. Like you said, if, if you've invested three thousand dollars in a system, you're going to defend it until. You're not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, yeah. and then uh, you know, who knows if you know I'll be around when when that moment happens or not. So it, it's a waste of time. But what I what I do like uh, the conversations I do like to have is you know how are people using their cameras? What what creative things have you found in your camera that really excite you? Like for instance, uh, that G ninety five that I just held up. You know, I found one or two things in there that I really like, and it it, it kind of got me on a little creative streak there for a couple of days. And uh, those conversations interest me. And if someone's got a camera that's doing something that they're doing something creative with, 
I, I do want to have that conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I was in Puerto Rico last year with a bunch of commercial photographers. Uh, I was with the RGG EDU folks down there, and it was interesting. The the conversations, most of the conversations we had, are great conversations, even the the ones that weren't alcohol fueled, but they were. <laughs> 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 we had a ton of great conversations about photography. And the one thing that I noticed is missing, especially from someone like you or I that's done hundreds of discussions and podcasts about photography. The one thing that was conspicuously missing from those conversations was any talk about gear. They would talk about lighting and lighting equipment before they even brought up the camera because the camera is an f-stop and a shutter speed and a sensor. Right. And they would yeah. talk more about the 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 thrust of the most of the conversations was about what they were shooting and the latest creative thing that had them in, ex, excited or inspired and you know that that sort of thing and then you look at other genres of people in the industry or consumers and it's all about the gear right I even have a show yeah. called All About the Gear right it's all about yeah. it's it's all about you know what's you, what do you shoot you know and that's that's an instant disqualifier to a to a high end pro. That, you know, for for someone that's not a high end pro to say, oh, what do you shoot with instead of saying, what kind of art are you making? Right. So, yeah. Or, or what interesting things are you are you doing with your camera? You know, right. you know, what kind of projects have you been on? You know what? Yeah. Like, for instance, uh, let's talk about the G95 for a second. Yeah, okay. I totally want to talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Bring that thing up here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's get that little puppy up here. Is that the one now, you're dropping in the mail to me? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is a fun camera, it, and it's sort of between the G9, G85 uh, thing. But one of the one of the features that I discovered with it when I was testing it that I fell in love with was uh, the L Monochrome D, uh, you know, picture style, mm -hmm. and I love black and white photography. I always have. I just, I just think it is so beautiful. And certain cameras, Fujifilm has great black and white, uh, you know, modes on it. Yeah. Uh, the Olympus Pen F has uh, wonderful black and white. And this L Monochrome D, which is on uh, the G95, has that same sort of uh, deep blacks, a uh, little extra contrast, uh, you know, feels a little bit like Tri-X or HP5 uh, yeah, 400. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I started shooting images with it and I, I couldn't get it off that <laughs> that setting. You know really? I mean? It's like instant just, photojournalism, right? Oh, it was. And, and I go, man, I'm a good photographer. And <laughs> I'm amazing. <laughs> I'm amazing. You know, I, I'm shooting like a brick wall, you know. <laughs> That's going to be a background. Look at me. I can't, yeah. I can't lose here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so my tip was when I did the review on the last podcast of it is, you know, go ahead, shoot raw plus JPEG, which, you know, I, I say all the time. Yeah. The JPEGs will be this beautiful L monochrome D image. And then you still have the raw file. So if you want to go back and, and work a color version of it, you know, you have that file. But, you know, an interesting exercise is to take that raw file and try to make a black and white that looks like that L monochrome D. It's not easy. Oh, <laughs> it really? Yeah, it'd be very difficult, uh, especially if you're not a black and white processing expert. So just the fact that right out of the camera, you can get this, this beautiful, beautiful black and white image that really makes you look like you know what you're doing. That's when I get excited about, you know, uh, shooting with a, one camera or another. You know, like people, people like you and I that have spent a significant portion of our lives in a dark room understand what it can, can appreciate an awesome looking oh, perfect image you know black and white which is almost unattainable with an enlarger unless you're ansel adams with a with a bunch of time <sighs> on your hands right so. uh oh the, the hours i've wasted <laughs> <laughs> but those are you right. know to digress those are some therapeutic therapeutic hours i remember the dark room yeah. days with the radio on in there you know playing and you just make it prints and, and tick cracking jokes with other people exactly um, yeah, getting a, getting a little lightheaded from the vapors. You know? <laughs> got, got, got more developer and fixer in your blood than you do red blood cells. I still got some up here. <laughs> Those were the days, man. I was. Yeah, you know. man. Um, oh, man. So on this, on the, um, you know, the the. Uh, 
you know, so we're talking about sort of the, the bodies, the G, what is this, the G95 versus the G85. You mentioned before we started recording that there were several things that you love about that camera, the, that particular picture profile being one of them. But there are also some things that you don't like about that camera. What are what are the give us a give us a plus and minus sort of analysis? Yeah, there's there's two things in particular. The first one has to do with uh, the, the 4K video. Uh, which, you know, Panasonic, I always have high expectations for the video that comes out of any of their cameras. And um, it does have an excellent 4K video capture mode, 30 frames, all that. But uh, they put a crop factor of uh, 1.25 on the 4K video. Oh. And, you know, most most photographers are going to be walking around with, uh, at most, uh, the, the 12 to something, you know, lens. You know, in yeah. this case, this is a 12 to 60. Uh, which means that if you're shooting 4K, um, you do the crop factor and everything else, you're going to end up with the 30 millimeters as your widest uh, field of view mm -hmm. on a 4K camera. And that just isn't wide enough for a camera that touts itself as being, uh, you know, a hybrid, you know, video capable as well as stills capable camera. I mean, you're establishing shots. There's a lot of times and you just need more than 30 millimeters so i was really disappointed in that and i actually did a little reading as to why th that's there and uh, some other reviewers felt like uh, it was lack of processing power they just didn't put enough processing power in the camera uh to to go full I, I don't know what the reason is but i was really disappointed in that and that was kind of a a deal breaker for me yeah. uh, in terms of shooting 4k and then the other thing is actually has to do with this. So what they do in the U.S. and I believe Canada is that the only way you can get this, this camera, is with this lens. Oh, it's they a bundle only? Really? A bundle only in U.S. and I believe Canada and some other places also. And, uh, you know, this is a nice enough lens. I mean, but... <laughs> <laughs> I love I mean, that look. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what is it, F3.5 to 5.6? Yeah, it's you know, a daytime uh, I mean, tourist walk around uh, lens, right? And it's, it's, for me, it's kind of big for, you know, for, you know, what I want to do here. Oh, right, know? right. You know, okay, so, so I'm going, so you're making me buy this lens that I don't want in order to get a camera that I'm kind of interested in. And uh, the camera is twelve hundred dollars with the lens. Oh, jeez! And mm -hmm. and I feel like they should be selling the camera for eight ninety five without the lens. And yeah. uh, then you know, then they have something that I'm interested in. So I just I don't understand this uh, part of it at all. And um, if I wasn't reviewing this, and you know, I will send the camera back. I don't get to keep this stuff. But uh, if sometimes I do want to keep it, you know, I, you know, someone sends me something, I want to keep it. And I said, I'm going to buy it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I pay the price that everyone else pays. Yeah. And, um, you know, like because of this, I'm not going to spend 1200 bucks and, and end up with this thing. This is going to sit on my shelf. Yeah. So it'll I, sit on your shelf or you'll have to figure out a way to get rid of it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Pawn it off on someone else, you know, some poor. Un <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would say, that's that's an interesting play, especially considering like I have that lens already. I think it came as uh -huh. a bundle of something else. I wonder right. what's going on there. I wonder if it's if do they have too many of those lenses and they're like, we're going to force feed those to the public and they're going to like them. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, some dude just left a machine on and, you know, they got a whole <laughs> warehouse full of them or something. I don't know what it is. But, yeah, but yeah. I mean, for guys like me and I'm probably suspecting for you, this is not going to be a, a, a lens that, that you want to carry around all the time, you know. So uh, I, I don't understand that. And, and it, like I said, it jacks up to twelve hundred dollars, which. Now twelve hundred dollars, you start thinking a lot more about that than you do eight ninety five. At least I do. Absolutely, absolutely. So here, here's the last question about that that camera. Um, there's a ton. I mean, there's a bunch of reviews. You've talked about it, you know. Um, but I'm looking. I look at it when I first saw that camera and I read the specs about it. I thought this is a move. This is sort of an incremental move on Panasonic side. And this is not me speaking from any internal knowledge or anything, um, but sort of a move to get to standardize on that 20 megapixel sensor, right? So this is, 
a G85 essentially with with a couple of polisher polishing bits on there, but they put the the bigger sensor in there so they can move away from 16 megapixels across the line. Do you is there any logic to that? Do you think? I think there is logic to that, and I think. Uh, 20 megapixels is where both Panasonic and Olympus need to be uh, on their Micro Four Thirds. Uh, the image quality is fantastic at 20 megapixels. They uh, they know how to process uh, you know the the data that comes off those sensors into really really good looking files. And uh, 20 megapixels is a very usable size. Uh, you know I rarely uh, need anything uh, you know more than that. So uh, I think, yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it. And I, I don't like shooting with 16 megapixels anymore. I still have a couple of favorite cameras that shoot at 16, but uh, almost everything I'm shooting with is at 20 or 24 megapixels. Yeah. Yeah. Me too, for the most part, except for mm -hmm. this camera that I'm on right now. <laughs> so this is, right. this is a GH4. I believe that's still 16. That was still 16 yeah. megapixels, right? Yeah. And for video though, I mean... Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fine. It's, it yeah. sits on a tripod. I give it lots of light. It's it's very happy. But but along those lines, though, the four megapixel difference between sixteen and twenty, mm -hmm. it, the difference for you is that market. It's that evident that you can you can like. What are the main differences? Is it low light performance? Yeah. Is it noise? Like what what do you see? You know what it is. It it gives me a little bit more room to crop. Yeah, uh, I mean that's yeah. that's what I like. I like because. I have to be careful. I tend to want to shoot uh, exactly. Uh, I want to frame it perfectly in the camera. And a lot of my clients discourage me from doing that because they go, well, the, the art director is going to want a little extra room or a little extra elbow room, you know, to put some type here to do this, or we got to fit it in a weird format. So a lot of times uh, for my client work, especially I have to shoot a little bit wider than I want to. Uh, but if they end up not needing uh, that extra space, and I like to be able to crop it back to the way that I saw it and still have a, a, a nice size file. And just the difference between 16 and 20 for me allows me to crop a little bit and still have a, a very, a very nice file. And that's the biggest reason for me. Yeah. No, love it. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also while I have you here, and I'll, I'll, I'll end this. I promise. I know you, you're like, can we this? Can this be over? Like right now. <laughs> Are you kidding? Micro Four Thirds? I could talk about that forever. <laughs> well, good. Well, I want to talk. I want to. I want to talk a little bit more about Olympus. So, you know, I was looking at the their current lineup. Those guys aren't playing around. I mean, like you were you're saying, they're they're different in the in in terms of Micro Four Thirds and the whole aesthetic that they they go after. But looking at the specs on their top end cameras. Those things are beasts, right? Okay. They are beasts. And you're, you said one of your walk-around cameras is the what? It's one of those top-end cameras, right? Yeah, I like the EM1 Mark II. I, I, I don't understand why the EM1 Mark II isn't just like killing it in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I really, uh, for, for the price of that camera and what it delivers, uh, it is it is a crazy camera, and, uh, and what what makes it crazy? What do you what do you love about it in particular? Well, uh, first of all, Olympus just they've already had I think three major firmware updates on this, so this camera has gotten better over time. It now focuses basically with the same speed and precision as uh, the EM1X, um, and that just happened with the recent firmware update. So uh, performance is fantastic. It's got a great, uh, I think it's got dual microprocessors, all that stuff in there. It has dual card slots, uh, which you know is very useful uh, mm -hmm. when you're a working photographer. It's compact, but yet it still has a nice grip, so you can put the 40 to 150 or some of those little bigger lenses on there and still hold it comfortably. It's uh, just a very comfortable camera. Um, it, it, it tears through the RAW files. It's got fast uh, burst modes. It's got basically every sort of uh, crazy, wild thing you want to do, you know, in yeah, terms yeah. of live composite and, you know, all, you know, professional capture modes, and all that. I mean, it is a top-notch professional camera. And the thing about it is when I go out on a shoot uh, for a client with that camera, I have confidence in what I'm going to come away with. And, you know, that camera – just it, it just makes me feel like everything's going to be all right, and uh, 
Yeah, and and, uh, and it is. It, and yeah. the reason why I have that confidence is because time after time uh, it has proven itself. So, I mean, for a camera that is that compact, that light, that feels good in the hand, and that powerful, I just – for that price, which is what I mean, you can get a lot of times for twelve hundred bucks. Yeah, uh, I just don't understand why it's not just mowing it over in the marketplace. But um, you know, Olympus is a, is a niche camera brand. You know, they have their following, and um, people are going, well, "How come you're shooting that, and not Canon, or that, and not an Icon?" I go, huh. uh, "Because I like it better." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so funny that we get that question, and people are okay with that, and I. In the in the Twip Pro community, there was a thread, I think, um, and I I posited the question like, do you do you ask like I wonder if anyone other than painters cared about what kind of paintbrush you know Da Vinci was using? <laughs> you know, exactly. Were they obsessing? Exactly. Was it camel hair and what kind of camel? You know, because yeah. that makes a difference in the color saturation of the you know. No <laughs> one cared. You know, it was no about the cared. art. No one cared. Yeah. So. So, yeah, yeah, and you know, and no one cares on the client side anymore either. There was a time when, if you came with uh, something like the EM1 Mark II, uh, where maybe an art director would look at you and go, you know, are we going to be okay? <laughs> and you're going, yeah, yeah, yeah it's going to be fine. That's gone. I, I, I just show up with that camera all the time, and um, you know, we just go crazy. We just have yeah. fun. See, that was that was back in the day, right? I mean, back mm -hmm. in the day, i.e., a couple of years ago, when I remember, I remember uh, interviewing. Um, she was a Sony photographer. We were talking about the A7. It was around the time when the A7 series just launched, um, and so it was still very new, but small and mirrorless, and you know. And I remember interviewing this photographer, and he was he was talking about how for his commercial jobs, he had to have a larger alpha on the table with a, an assortment of lenses for theater, right? Just so, mm -hmm. just so exactly. the client could see that he was a real photographer shooting with something larger than what they probably had access to. So, yeah. but you're, you feel like those days are either going or gone. They're gone. They're gone. Yeah. I, I, nobody cares anymore uh, yeah. about that. So, uh, I mean, I, I would say the only insecurity would be that would it would come from the photographer, his or herself. But uh, certainly I don't see it from the clients at all. Love it. Well, Derek Story, what's next for you, man, before I let you get off the get off the hot seat and get on with your day? What's uh, you got more podcasts coming up? You doing any workshops, taking people around the world? What's happening? I do. I do. I just uh, I just published a podcast on the nimble photographer that I think in line of uh, this thing about, you know, artists, rather than using a camera or some other uh, something else to create their art. Uh, one with a musician named George Shaw, who had this crazy idea as a kid uh, in school, uh, in college, that he wanted to interview jazz musicians to find out is uh, being a, a great jazz musician, is it hereditary or is it something that you learn? Is mm -hmm. it your environment? Yeah. And he got this grant and one thing led to another. He tells a story on the podcast where suddenly he's interviewing B.B. King and he's interviewing Sarah Vaughn and Chick Corea and all these guys. And they, they, they just passed him from one to the next, and he just accumulated all these wonderful stories and, uh, you know, worked on this idea of his. And he's an artist himself. He's a musician and a, a producer and all that. And uh, I, I just think that sometimes it's nice uh, if we step outside of our particular art and listen to other artists and how their process works. Uh, you can get some ideas there that can really help you when you come back to home base. So I would encourage folks to listen to that latest uh, podcast at thenimblephotographer.com or it's on Google Play. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's all those places. But uh, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. The Nimble Photographer or depending on where you're from, The Nimble photographer yes so yes. <laughs> the nimble photographer.com or wherever fine podcasts are are subscribed to right <laughs> i love that wherever you listen to your podcast we're it's there, there. We're it's there. on stitcher it's on all those places yeah google play stitcher mm -hmm. itunes on and, mm -hmm. on and on and on, on and yeah on. we got it we have to do another show at some point where we talk about 
podcasting and the evolution of it, mm -hmm. you know, from, from yes. your perspective, my perspective, because tools have changed. The distribution mechanisms have changed. The, the perception yeah. and stigma that used to be around podcasting has sort of flipped, that's, you know, that's gone now. <laughs> yeah. Man. I mean, yeah, uh, everyone I mean, wants it, a podcast now, right? <laughs> so. Well, it feels like everyone's starting a podcast. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, come on, guys. I mean, I want to be popular, but I don't want everyone at the party. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I know. But, I know. Uh, I know, but it, it's, I think with a lot of people, and we'll leave it at this, a lot of people figure out when they're starting podcasts, de depending on their level of enthusiasm mm -hmm. and, and reality around podcasting, it's a lot of work, right? Each and every episode is. is a lot of work, both before, during, and after to make sure that you maintain a certain level of quality, audio, video, guest scheduling, all that stuff. Right. So yeah, if you can, you know, yeah. people that go in with unrealistic expectations of like, oh, Frederick does that. I could do that. What the, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> you know, whatever piece of cake, rude yeah. awakening. And you end up with an, ep with a podcast in iTunes with four episodes, you know, yeah. the last one released in 2017. So yeah, exactly. And you know, one of the things that George Shaw talked about in the interview I was just referring to, he says, you've got to be good at your career craft, whatever yeah. your craft is. And uh, if you're going to be a podcaster, you have to learn audio. I mean, that's just the way it is. Yeah. You know, yep. uh, no way around it. And I'm still learning and, audio, my friend. And, <laughs> no kidding. And RSS and, you know, all that other stuff. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It's a word salad, but it's fun. You have to you have to know that it is, you know, it's a it's a journey. And you and yes. I, every time we do a new show or a new episode, I learn another tidbit or figure out something. And, you know, and there's no way you can grok all that from reading an article or taking a course no. or something. You just no. have to be in the trenches doing it, making mistakes, figuring it out and do it again. But and if you don't exactly. like that, then, you know, you're going to fail. So, you got to. And you if you don't like if you don't like late nights, then. Do something else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Netflix and chill, man. Netflix. <laughs> exactly. Cool. All right, Derek Story, thank you so much. So the yep. digital story and the nimble photographer, all roads lead there. So if people want to catch up with you, they can just head over to either one of those URLs and and start from there. But I do suggest people sign up for for everything you're doing, including the podcast, because like I said, you are a veteran podcaster. You know your way around the mic and how to keep a conversation going. And it's all about photography. So what else What else is there? To, it's to, good you know? stuff, man. Come it's, on. It is good stuff. All right, Derek yeah. Story, man. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks so much, Frederick. Yeah. See ya. This is Twitter.